All right. Quick survey of the group. <clears throat> of everybody here, who's uh, been to one of the tool talks at a con? So I've got two. That's actually more than I was anticipating. <laughs> but uh, what con did you go to? Uh, like the 18? 17? The last oh, one the Rio. Uh, DEF CON? Yeah. Uh, that would have been 18, yeah. And so anyway, and then he went to Hope a couple years ago. Um, my name's Steve. Uh, amongst uh, the hacker cons, I go by Nuclear Steve. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I don't don't call me Nuclear Steve. I don't need to be. Anyway, I'm a member of Tool, which is the open organization of lock pickers. Uh, started in uh, the Netherlands by Barry Wells, also known as Barry the Key. You can find a lot of his videos on the internet. Uh, him and Han Fei, uh, good friends of mine, hung out a lot of cons. Uh, anyway, is anybody planning to go to DEF CON this year? Or Hope? Okay, well, anyway, this is essentially a standard talk that we started doing a couple years ago. Um, we had a huge problem with tons of people coming to the cons, and um, we would try and help them individually, one by one. And it got really, really tiring. And so we said, well, let's make a, a presentation. And then every hour we'll give a presentation about how to pick locks, you know, an intro. And then that way everybody can go out and try it. And we don't have to sit down with each individual person. And we can just send, send people out to sort of help amongst, amongst the tables and the like. So um, this is uh, essentially what we came up with. So I'll just dive pretty much into it. Intro to lock picking. And uh, by the way, feel free to stop me any point for whatever questions. So, uh, with lock picking, invariably there are a couple of rules. Um, being able to violate locks that other people put on things imposes some moral questions. So anyway, when it comes to rules that tool as an organization follows, um, do not pick locks which you do not own. And I sort of, uh, I like to say maybe not just locks that you don't own, but it, it really it's more which ones you don't have permission to. Because say a friend of yours owns one and they say, here, pick this. Okay, you don't own the lock, but you can pick it, right? Um, anyway, do not pick locks which you rely on. And this one, yeah, even if your friend relies on the lock and says you can pick it, I don't suggest it. So, for example, don't pick the lock on the front door of your house. If you break it, um, that poses problems for you, expense, uh, time. And the awkward conversation with the... Uh, the, uh, the, the lock, whatever thing. locksmith comes and I visits. Yeah. Stuck in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or, I, uh, Say just a funny story. I had a friend of mine, a, a, a good friend whom, uh, you know, we both got into this lock picking thing together and I wanted to go and get something from his house and he wasn't there. And so I called him up, hey man, you mind if I just pick the front door, and go get it. And so I picked the front door. Well, unbeknownst to me, he had repinned the lock. And at the time we weren't as experienced as we are now. So um, he had repinned the lock himself and the, the pin stack in the back was way too short altogether. So, and I'll, we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, you, you'll see what I mean, but the, the spring in the back extended beyond the shear line. And so I go to turn the lock and I, it, it jammed. I couldn't turn it. I got the door unlocked, but then I couldn't unlock it. I couldn't, it was, it was stuck. And so, um, well, he just happened to have a pin kit sitting on the stairs of his house. So I disassembled the whole lock and rebuilt it in his kitchen and then put it back together and it, it all worked out in the end but he was very not pleased that, <laughs> that i had damaged it in the first place it was a learning experience for both of us anyway so continue on lock picking is easy um just a, i guess a, another side note this is a presentation that a, another friend of mine puts together and he always seems to have these great long dissertations and stuff that go along with exactly why he made this slide and and is really good at his presentation skills Frankly, I, you know, beyond saying lock picking is easy, this slide's kind of useless to me. But anyway, pin tumbler locks. The thing about pin tumbler locks is that you see them everywhere. They they make up the majority of the locks you see. 
Um, the lock on the front door of the building out here and on your door here is a pin tumbler lock. The one you see in the picture, most door handles like are pin tumbler locks. All of these padlocks I have sitting on the table in front of me are pin tumbler locks. Um, here's a, another example. It's a padlock that's uh, on a gate. This is uh, a lock that's in a, uh, a utility cabinet. Uh, and so anyway, when you're looking at the outside of a pin tumbler lock, what you see here is essentially the lock. Now, this part here, the outer part, is called the body of the lock. The, the yellow part in the middle is called the plug. And uh, what you can see, this is the keyway. And then in the, the diagram, you see red. That's the, um, the bottom pin or the key pin. Uh, we like to refer to them as the key pin and the driver pin. Uh, here would be a cutaway for you, the key pin and the driver pin. And the, re the reason you refer to them as that is because you'll find things mounted upside down. Uh, in the United States, that's not extremely common, but in Europe, it's actually the standard uh, for everything to be mounted opposite of how you might see it in the United States. So key pin, driver pin, not top pin and bottom pin, because when you turn the lock upside down, top pin and bottom pin are different. And so imagine the, the, the translation difficulties if you're working with somebody from the Netherlands. You say, well, can you feel the, the bottom pin? Well, hell no, I can't. As, okay, anyway, so when you have your cutaway view, key pin, driver pin, spring, and the break between the plug and the body of the lock is referred to as the shear line. So anyway, in the, this is a sort of an animation. You see that you're attempting to turn the lock without a key at all. And uh, you see the driver pin is binding up at the shear line and the lock won't turn. It's very, very, very simply how a lock works. So when you insert the key and it lifts up the pins, or in this case, we'll just refer, look at this as a single pin lock, lifts up the key pin so that the break between the key pin and driver pin is at the shear line and the plug turns. Now, Looking at the same cutaway sideways, you have the plug and your driver pins. If you're attempting to turn the lock oh, with, a, with a key, you insert the key and all the pins line up nicely at the shear line and the lock will open. If you have a key with a bit that's too low, the driver pin, in this case that's just one, one notch too low, the uh, driver pin here will prevent the lock from turning. So really, you could come up with a lot of combinations of keys that won't work, even if they're really close. Same thing if the if the uh, bit is too high, the key pin blocks the plug from turning. So in a perfect world, you have a plug with perfectly straight drilled holes, the exact same size. The pins fit into them perfectly and all the pins bind against the side of the uh, body of the lock at exactly the same time when you try and turn the lock. Whereas, in reality, you look at manufacturing tolerances of things, this is a, a lock that we bought at a hardware store and we took apart right there, brand new out of the package, that's not, you know, worn for, you know, 20, 30 years in front of somebody's house, that's brand new. They, uh, they round the corners, you know, camphor the edges, uh, the, you know, they're all made of cast metal as opposed to machine metal. It's, uh, it's really a cost thing when it comes down to it. And in some cases, it has to do with smooth operation of the lock. If you buy a brand new lock and it doesn't, it doesn't turn really easily, people will say, oh, don't buy that. They, they don't work. Whereas if you insert the key and it smoothly operates every time, hmm, it works great. But sometimes rounding the edges on things makes, thing, makes uh, locks operate smoothly. Here's uh, pins. You know, in a perfect world, the pins would have perfectly cut and so that they would match up. <clears throat> Whereas really they round the edges. These have imperfections in them that sometimes imperfections like that can actually frustrate picking. And that's, uh, uh, when it comes down to it, sometimes you get a really crappy lock and uh, they'll, they have, uh, their picking frustrations built in just because they're that crappy. So anyway, in the real world, um, and on the on this, you know, I do this on a huge presentation screen. These things look uh, kind of really kind of crooked. These ones are over this way. And so anyway, um, in the real world, nothing's ever straight. 
it's it, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it's not not going to be perfect. And so when you try and turn this plug in the lock, only one of the pins is binding against the uh, shear line. And what this allows for, that it essentially allows for picking. So here you have a plug, the key pin and driver pin, and it shows lifting the pin without a key, it's setting a binding pin. So essentially you turn the, turn the plug without a key, and this pin binds, and you can feel it with the pick, and then you push that pin up while you're holding tension on the plug and at the shear line when the when the pin sets the plug turns and the locks open in this case it'd be a, a one pin lock now uh, something interesting to note uh, is that when you do this without a key once uh, once you open the lock the key pin can fall back down so if you're just holding the lock in front of you and looking at it and you say oh this pins down still I, I still need to pick it not necessarily the case. You may have already picked that pin of the lock, but it doesn't seem so. So, an example of setting multiple pins in a lock, you take a tension wrench of some variety, which very, very basic. This is a piece of flat metal bent on the end. Insert it in the lock, and you go through with your pick, and you feel each pin one at a time, looking for the pin that's binding. The one that's binding will have resistance to it when you push. You'll be able to tell. So, in this case, he's found the binding pin. The plug turned a little bit to the next binding pin, and uh, move on to that, move on to that pin. Yeah. And so slowly, you go through each set of pins in the lock one at a time until it opens. That's the basics of lock picking. Any questions? Yes, sir. Is there is there one? Portion wrench and one pick that works on 85, 90% of the lock. Yeah. Well, the, the, the tension wrench is really very simple. Yeah. I mean, some people, I guess, have come up with but very the, small variations on design. What about the pick shape? The picks, we'll talk about that in a second. All right. Something uh, uh, we, when I t was talking earlier, when you had the, the key that you inserted with the, the bit that was too high, Something to be wa uh, wary of is overlifting, meaning if you lift up this pin stack, that's, uh, that's fine. But if you push too far, then you end up with a point where uh, the key pin is now too high and it's bound against the side of the lock. That causes two problems. You think you've set that pin, and then on top of that, um, you'll go along and every other pin you try and pick afterwards, you won't find any you won't find any more pins that'll set because that pin's still bound. How do you know how far it goes? Um, or how it's, do you know it's, sort of a, it's sort of a touch thing. I mean, the, the idea is, is that when each pin sets, the plug rotates a small amount. And, you, you know, you get it with practice, but um, it's not that, it's, it's actually pretty easy to tell. Um, with really good locks, it's not so easy to tell, but Anyway, other tools one uses. Now this is where we're talking about uh, just where we go through a couple of the different tools. Uh, raking. Raking is really effective and it works a lot, you know, all the time. Um, it doesn't really have any finesse. You don't really, it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to do, but it doesn't work 100% of the time either. Um, uh, this example basically shows taking a rake, insert it, you, uh, while holding tension, you run the rake back and forth a couple of times and sort of by accident set the pins all to the shear line. That's essentially it. It's almost, almost a, luck, a luck approach. But, um, you know, in applications where I've actually picked locks for people, like if, if I was to help them with something, mm -hmm. um, usually in, I'd go the fast route about it. I would rake some and then go back and find the pins that the rake wasn't able to set. It's, it's pretty easy. So anyway, the half diamond pick, which uh, tool at the cons, we sell uh, basic pick kits with like six picks in them. Um, it's sort of a really basic beginner set, and these are the three tools that's in them. There's two of each, one with and one without a handle. Um, and so that way you get a feel for whether you like the handles or not. Um, the uh, 
All the first ones were shown with the uh, short hook, which is pictured on the left. Looks about like so. You can pass it around. Um, the rake, which was shown, is this. It's uh, I don't know. Some people call it a snake rake. Some people call it various others, depending upon its model number and certain brands. It's sort of like a M rake or a S rake or whatever. That's uh, that's that pick. And then I also have in the middle. It shows a half diamond. The half diamond is versatile because you can use it to rake and pick single pin. When I first started picking, that's all I used. But I learned after a while that it was kind of difficult to to uh, pick things with that. But uh, what distinguishes a basic beginner set from a higher end set? Uh, higher end sets will often have things with um, various other shapes and whatnot for uh, specific purposes. Um, they'll also come with sometimes various different styles of tension wrenches. Um, for example, I have, a, I have a tension wrench. I have a couple of tension wrenches, like this one here is designed for a tulip uh, type of keyway, where um, the tulip is a, a model, like a style of keyway, and you find them in houses where the inside of the, the top is dished in, and so the lock is set in a little ways, and so if you try to use a standard flat pick, the end of this can't reach the lock because it's set in a little bit, and so you would use a little bit different style of tension wrench for that. Or there's also um, some of these, which is, this is kind of a cool style of tension wrench where instead of inserting it in the, in the lock uh, just in the bottom, it, uh, let me get the little thing off here, it's uh, a little like wishbone shape. And uh, when you insert it in the lock, it goes into the top and bottom of the keyway and you have more room to work in between. Uh, it's kind of cool. They have their purposes and whatnot, but you won't find these in the beginner set. Uh, stuff like that. it's just a couple of examples. Some uh, some additional rake styles, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the uh, on the slide though you have uh, the half diamond. What I was talking about is lifting with the half diamond. Yeah, you can do that. Um, you can rake with a half diamond. And something else very useful to know how to do is to figure out how many pins are in the lock. You take the rake, you insert it upside down with the flat edge, and uh, you lift all the pins up. And you, as uh, you lift them up as high as they'll go, and as you pull the rake out, you can hear each pin stack snap back down one at a time. Then you can count, and you'll know exactly how many pins are in the lock. So these, for example, have four pins. I know that just from experience. But say you approach a lock, and you think it's got five or six pins or something or other. Uh, there was a lock that I tried to pick once that somebody brought me. And I sat there for a while, fooled with it, fooled with it, fooled with it. And then I took this, and I stuck it in there, and I counted, and it had eight pins. You won't encounter locks like that very often, but it sure shocked me when I found that. So anyway, applying tension. The basics of applying tension, you have your tension wrench, which here, if you want to go ahead and pass this around too, but you have your tension wrench, you insert it in the lock, and um, this, uh, the picture here is showing an example of bad tension wrench usage. So if you just put the tension wrench in the lock, and you put your thumb on it like so. Um, a couple of things. People that do this have a tendency to be pushing like that. That's not turning the lock. That's just pushing on the tension wrench. It doesn't do anything. Much better way to hold it would be like that because you're applying rotational motion to the plug of the lock. Some people with this particular lock you could do with your thumb, you can go that way, but just pushing on it in front like that is not, not good. So um, something else is that with the tension wrench, if you push out of the tip, you get much more leverage, so you don't have to push as hard. And so, you know, push out here. In the picture, it shows an example of good tension tool pressure. You see that they're just touching the tip with their finger. That's plenty. If you're pushing more than just touching, you really, you know, um, it's too much. The uh, this picture shows too much. If you can, if you're turning your the end of your finger white, you've probably got about ten times too much pressure on the end of the pick. There's um, on the end of the tension wrench. There's uh, an example that 
some of the other guys always give that I uh, can't remember off the top of my head right now, but it's something um, uh, it'll come back to me later. Anyway, too much tool pressure. What? Not all, no. So, and then here we're talking, here's a couple of examples. This one's just an edge of the plug. That's the kind of tension wrench that comes with most kits. Uh, these, uh, these are tension tools. You might find that this one here is that same tulip style. Uh, this here has a shortened end on the other end. And then this one has a half twist. And the half twist helps. Uh, you can get lighter tension with them. They're a little springy. I, I find it to be a personal preference kind of thing. Um, so space in the keyway, if you're using a, a standard flat or a, you know, a standard just bent piece of metal like this or a, a one of the other flat cut tension wrenches, it takes up that much space in the keyway. So if you're working in a particularly small keyway, uh, sometimes that's not very, not very good. This is just showing you about, you've got that much room to work between the top of the tension wrench and at least these first couple of pins. Whereas on oh, something else is that the, the bottom of the keyway is almost always open. So if you have your tension wrench in and you're pushing down on it, you end up, in some cases, the tension wrench wedges in there. And so you think you're giving tension to the lock, but you're not. Uh, you just, you've essentially just jammed it in place. Sometimes that happens. It's just something to watch out for. Uh, and then something, this is where uh, some of my friends like to use these flat tension tools uh, where they've just notched the very end and you insert it in the top of the keyway like so with this small, the small notched end like that. And the deal with that is that they fit in in front of the uh, front pin in the lock and it gives you a lot more room to work provided that the, uh, the warding in the lock isn't abusive. Uh, it's really sometimes the way to go. The what in the lock? The what? Oh, the, the, right the, the, the warding, which in, the warding would be like the, the lengthwise cuts in the key. Okay. Um, I can give you an example in a minute. I've got some keys I can pull out and show you. Yeah. But anyway, tension direction. Uh, how do you know which way to turn a lock? Well, uh, most every padlock in the world goes to the right. That's, uh, you know, if you go out and buy a lock to try and practice with something from the hardware store, padlocks are cheap and effective and they all go to the right. Master padlocks, on the other hand, go both directions because they're cheap and crappy. Uh, so, padlocks go to the right. Uh, your standard key and knob, like you find in most houses, all go to the left. With the exception of Schlag brand, they go to the right. Don't ask me why. And then uh, deadbolt. Uh, deadbolt always turns away from the door jam for the purpose of unlocking, always turns away from the door jam. So if, you, if the, the deadbolt's on the right side of the door, you would turn to the left. If the deadbolt's on the left side of the door, you turn to the right. Uh, that's, there's uh, one additional uh, slide that's not in here, the it, a slide that I keep saying, we should add this, is if you have a, a, a mortise style lock that's in a, a commercial application, they always turn towards the, the door jam. So like uh, in your college dorm, the keys always turn towards the door jam to unlock them, unless, it's a, unless it uses a deadbolt style, whereas mine was a, a retracting latch, at least the, the dorm that I lived in. When you say turns away, are you saying that the, you got the open part of the keyway and then it kind of closes off the middle? Are you saying that that's always up? That means that's up and down? Can you go back to your picture of the... Okay, so is that lock facing right side up? Yeah. Okay. Well... Because I've seen them where that's upside down. So then away would be towards. Oh, well, when I say away, I'm, I'm referring to like counterclockwise and clockwise. So if the, if, if the, door, or the door lock is on the right side of the door as you're facing it, uh, the, then you're turning away from the door jam, which on that on the right side it would mean counterclockwise, and if the door lock is on the left side, it would mean clockwise. So the top goes away, not the bottom goes away. Yeah, it, it, in in an application in the United States, um, if the lock happens to be mounted upside down, then you know so be it. But it it's going to turn the same direction to unlock the lock okay. in all reality. Okay. So really, the main reason is because they they melt. 
Yeah, well, it's just it's just assumed that they always mounted up right. Because they, they don't make right-handed or left-handed deadbolts. I mean, it's just because you have to mount it on the upside door. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, that's why the so, so anyway, yeah, if you, I didn't think about that. Now that you say that, because if you if you if you if you buy a, a deadbolt at the hardware store and you mount it upside down, in uh, that means that you have to turn the turn the actual deadbolt mechanism upside down because the lock is off center a little bit. And so, if it's upside down, then it, it would, you're right, you would actually turn, the, the top would, yeah, so you would turn clockwise if it was on the right, which is strange. I guess I hadn't really thought about that too much, but yeah. I've got two doors that work that have the same key, uh -huh. but one's the left hand door, one's the right, so. And they both turn the same way? They turn the same way, but if you put your, you know, your, your uh, frame is here on one, and you're turning this way, and then on the other one, going this way, even though it's the same direction, one you're turning up and the other you're turning down. So you're both going towards the frame. So yeah, that's, that's that's interesting, yeah. No, I, I, it, I guess uh, we're assuming that they're all installed correctly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and so we just now had our discussion about left-handed and right-handed doors. Um, and so anyway, who wants to try? Who wants to try? All right. I have I have some, um, you know, a couple of picks and things. You guys can, you guys can all whatever you want. There's some if you want to give it a shot. But anyway, uh, I'd use the long end. Anyway, as a as an example, we have I have several of these uh, master padlocks. They're Fairly easy to pick. Um, excellent beginner locks. Hold on a sec. We'll, I'll, I'll get you another one. And then I have a couple of these um, practice locks that are uh, tools locks. And these are set up in a uh, progressive manner where each, uh, each one has a different number of pins in them. And so they've been set up so that you only have one, two, three, four, five pins in the lock, uh, and that way you can get a feel for what you know what picking a lock with one pin feels like, and then uh, you can go on. Here's a two pin, and then um, three pins. So that way you can progressively learn to pick locks rather than just jumping into it. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, like a little spring-loaded door. Usually it's just a weather cover or something or other to keep that's salt, that's dirt, and stuff. No, not really. That's actually a different style of lock, most cars. Um, I've got some examples, but it's those aren't pin tumbler locks at all. They're a different style. And you can pick them using similar techniques. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the keys are uh, a little bit more, uh, they're thicker, they, they're larger, they're intended to be a little bit more robust so that they don't break as easily or wear as easily. And then the, the little flap that you're talking about ends up being larger too. And so sometimes you need a larger, actually a larger tension wrench than some of this stuff. I've actually made up something that's bigger. Same. Oh no, I use I use these all the time. Um, I have uh, I have a set of what are called uh, jiggler keys, uh, and so these are commonly used for getting into cars and the like. You can come see those. So anyway, uh, in terms of practice locks, I've brought a whole bunch of things to practice with. I've got a, a handful of tools I can loan out. Uh, and you're all free to play. I've got these uh, progressive locks here. Um, with all the locks that I've got, except for these two, either direction will work. So you can turn the locks both directions. These things here are brand new, and I just got them. And what's interesting about them is they're the exact same thing as the old style of master lock. They've got this new variety. It's a little bit more expensive and looks more impressive, but isn't really. But it's it's set up so it's supposed to keep you from being able to pick to the left. But you still can if you use the top of the keyway method. So, 
Yeah, this the, the key that came with one of these doesn't work, and I don't. I you know, maybe I should take it back to Home Depot and complain. And so. So anyway, that's that's really the that's really the basic intro to lock picking talk. Uh, uh, they, uh, I can go through separately. I can do uh, rekeying the lock. Is something else that I had uh, talked about doing. If anybody is interested, uh, the reason we give the rekeying talk at uh, Tool Things is because some people want to be able to make their make their own uh, progressive lock sets. And so what we'll do is I'll show them how to take apart a lock. Uh, remove pin sets from them, put them back, or completely rekey it to a different key. Uh, some hardware stores sell rekey kits, so you can buy sets of pins with a key uh, to go into one of these. So, if anybody would like to see that. How would a master key work? Does it have like combinations there? Yeah, the, the master, master locks actually will have, um, hold on, let me go back to a previous slide. Just a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Key that opens all locks. Yeah, that's what he's looking for. Yeah, yeah. right. Not master. Yeah, not the brand. Yeah, no, I, I, I know what, I know what he was referring to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, in say, uh, say you have a, a lock like so, right? If you want to have two doors that you issue three keys for. One key will only open door A, one key will only open door B, and one key will open both doors, right? What you would do is you would insert a wafer. Uh, you would actually have three pins in one of these stacks. So you would have a very, uh, like a small wafer or something or other, and then key A would have the, the lower bidding key in the, in the next lock, one of the uh, key or driver pin, or the, the key pin would be different and it would still have the wafer then you would have a key that's slightly bitted differently and the two keys wouldn't work in either lock. But then with the wafer, uh, you could have one key that opened both locks. So that's, uh, that's a very basic example because that can be scaled up to systems that have you know, thousands of doors with one key that will open all doors. That would be like a grandmaster key. You would have a master key for say each building in a system. And then you would have uh, you could have individual zone keys that will only open, say, at, at the university that I that I went to, uh, they would have keys that only opened the laboratories but wouldn't open any of the offices. They would have keys that uh, opened all the laboratories and offices that the uh, uh, or and individual offices that the professors would get. And then you would have a master key that uh, typically uh, you would have a, a master key that janitors would have that would open all offices. Uh, computer labs, laboratories, and then you would have a grandmaster key for the building that, say, maintenance personnel would have to be able to get into all those rooms plus maintenance and equipment rooms and the like. So it, it, it's actually quite scalable. Uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the quick set. We actually give a we gave a whole talk. A, we gave a whole talk about about those at one of the cons recently, and they're really interesting locks. And they, um, by the way, they're designed. They're actually really difficult to pick. But um, Mark Tobias, who is a uh, he's a lawyer that specifically deals with physical security related cases, um, he did a talk at DEF CON 18, I believe, where he demonstrated uh, basically destroying one of those locks with a screwdriver. And so, even though even though they're difficult to pick, um, they don't afford a whole lot of security. So we all know that CSI is really realistic, and I have seen several times where they say double guys feel like they'll sign the you know they pick. Can you physically see whether or not someone's picked a lock or used to be? Uh, outright, it's kind of difficult. It kind of it, it's very difficult. Most um, most. Uh, surreptitious entry type things are, or uh, non-destructive entry is very difficult to detect. Uh, in some cases they can say this rock or this lock has definitely been picked because if you disassemble the lock and look at the pins up close you can see where it's been rubbed a certain way that, that a key wouldn't do, sort of, that sort of a thing. Uh, there have been talks about that at some of the cons as well. Um, um, Forensic, it's like lock forensics, is uh, what some of the talks were called. And these, um, 
Now, there's several different things you can do that will say yes for sure the lock was or was not picked, but sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes they're very good at it. There are certain methods that are very difficult to detect. Um, are old Kryptonite bicycle locks actually secure? Do you know what I'm when you say about? when you say old one, are you talking about the ones where they they say they could be opened with a big pen? Yeah, they, yeah, they take no, the, yeah, you take a twist. take a big pen and, and stuff yeah. it in and twist. Yeah, that's 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 how that works. Is, is that there a way that you can tell the ones that are worth locking your bike? Well, the, the the newer style, the newer style of um, kryptonite locks actually use an entirely different locking mechanism that definitely is not susceptible to the big pen thing. Yeah. Now, some of the some other brands uh, may or may not have gone away from something that a big pen couldn't open yep. but if you have a lock that uses a tubular lock this is a, a pick for a that's a that's a yep. pick for a, a tubular lock and I've got one if you want to try it out that concludes the official talk yeah cool thank you and uh, I uh, I'd be happy to show off anything I've got in my kit to anybody if you want to look so